We'll add some more states later in the summer. Mm -hmm. Indiana. The Ron Nuclear Bomb Program has been out of the headlines with all this other stuff going on. How close do you think Israel is to military action against Iran based on the red lines that Israel has drawn in the past if it gets too close to a bomb? So by the end of the summer, I think it's going to be a global effort. If Iran becomes nuclear, it is a threat to the American people as well, like we saw in 9 11. But we cannot wait forever because if Israel makes a mistake, it could be fatal. If the US will make a mistake, it will be hard, but you can overcome it. So we're talking about the weeks, but also not about years. I think we're in a year we have to reach a decision whether we do it ourselves or with our allies. And we see what's happening today with Hamas. Uh, it is not a peaceful community. It is a 
terror entity. So I think the issue is not the presence of Jews in Judea and Samaria. It is the presence of Jews in the Middle East. But are there not issues on both sides? In other words, are you calling for the permanent annexation of that land? Uh, and if so, then does that make Israel the occupier of a population of millions with no voting rights toward the occupying government? Absolutely not. But I think in the long run, and I say in the long run because I don't think we can achieve uh, this in the near future, we have to think about the long run. I think in the long run, uh, the Palestinians will have to realize that Jews will live in, in the land of Israel, in Judea and Samaria. The same way that today in Israel, you have 20% Arab Israelis who live in Israel. And I think today, we, we don't discuss it because it looks something beyond imagination. But in the long run, if there will be a real peace in the region, you will be able to live alongside Palestinians, also in Judea and Samaria. Right. And we just have a minute left, and we're obviously not going to settle the Israeli-Palestinian conflict today. But if I understand it correctly, you're talking about Palestinians, I mean, the Israeli Arabs can vote. The Palestinians can't vote in Israeli elections. But if they were allowed to vote like the Israeli Arabs, they would be uh, a majority of the population, would be a Jewish state in the sense that you think of it. So what were you actually describing that? No, in terms of number, there will not be a majority. But my vision for peace in the Middle East, that there will be a, a long term agreement where Israel will keep the majority of the land without the Palestinian population. I do not want to control you the Palestinian have, so, so you would hope that they would leave and they would go somewhere no, else? Absolutely not. They will stay where they are and we will discuss it with Jordan and Egypt in the long run. But Judea and Samaria, it's a large land that we can decide whatever decide, whatever state with Israel. And we have to leave it there, I'm sorry to say. Danny Benoni, Israel Deputy Defense Minister, author of Israel, The Will to Prevail. Thank you for coming on again. This is NPR on Sirius XM. For complete schedule and program details and our contact information, go to npr.org slash Sirius XM.
while we wait, go ahead and consider this. Streaming is a business model with more losses than profits. Now and maybe it's not really about the music anyway. Or at least it's a free finish. This is Patrick Stern's favorite song. In the past, he might have bought it and downloaded it. But now, I listen to Spotify pretty much the entire workday and then when I work in the evening. Spotify, like Pandora, is a streaming music service. I like an online radio. Spura is one of hundreds of millions of people who listen to music this way. But that's not where the money is. Mark Mulligan is co founder of Media Consult. The vast majority of digital music reviews at the moment are still downloading. The music industry brought in $4 billion last year from digital sales, but only about 15% of it came from streaming. So what gives? It is clearly where the future growth is going to be. Still, no streaming music company has earned a profit yet, according to Michael Robertson, CEO of EAR.FM. That's where he says Apple thinks it can do better. The biggest factor in the inability of, the, of the existing companies to make a profit are the very high royalties that they're forced to pay. To stream music, you have to pay the record label, the artist, and the songwriter every time that song gets played. Apple has been negotiating with major record labels to get not just better deals, but more freedom in how it can be used. Like more uh, ability to rewind or dance or now next five songs that are coming up. Things you can't do on Pandora, for example. At the end of the day, though, says Mulligan, the strategy for Apple is how to sell more devices. So if Apple gets into streaming music, it'll need to sell more Apple products on which to stream that music. In New York, I'm Super Ben Ashore. I'm going to go way out on a limb here and suggest that when you think of Walmart, you don't necessarily think of fresh strawberries or bananas, do you? Yeah, me neither. Nevertheless, the company announced today it's going to be making a big push to improve the quality of the fresh produce. Well, because it's Sarah Gardner, who from the sustainability desk, canned and frozen, it's not cut it anymore, even in the land of low, low prices. So, you can guess, what are the top three things Americans consume? Number one, a sandwich. Number two, fruit. And number three, vegetables. Yes, fruit and vegetables. And NPD group Harry Bolzer says Americans want them fresh. Walmart knows it, but C. Britt Deemer, chairman of America's research group, says the quality of Walmart's fresh produce? I would say it's inconsistent. Walmart says it's going to fix that with better employee training, weekly produce checks, and by cutting out the middleman. It already buys over 80% of its fruit and vegetables correctly. The Walmart promised the double sales of locally grown by the end of 2015. Beamer says that's the biggest challenge for such a huge company. Before, you may have had, let's say, 40 suppliers for your produce area. Now you may have to have 250 suppliers. So it's just a lot more suppliers, a lot more people to deal with, and more chances for failure out there. Walmart's also offering a money-back guarantee on wilted lettuce or bushy apples. Bruce Peterson used to run Walmart's fresh produce biz. He says Walmart's proved time and again it can compete with higher-priced retailers. But to change consumer perception in terms of quality is a difficult undertaking, even for Walmart. Peterson says he was struck by his former employer's decision to send 70,000 workers to a produce training program. The retailer known for hiring generalists, he says, is apparently finding out it's wise to have some specialists on the score floor as well. I'm Sarah Burton for Mark. Traders took their sweet time about it, but they worked their way to that happy music. Today we'll have the details. Silicon Valley, an explosion of 
data firm is looking for gold in mountains of medical information. Data holds the keys to unlocking a lot of the questions about what healthcare costs too much and what healthcare actually works. Andy Slavitt is executive vice president of Optum, the nation's largest collector of medical claims data. Optum employs an army of actuaries, scientists, and physicians. They slice and dice medication, treatment, and price data for more than 100 million people. Western health economist David Dronov says the industry's gotten so big so quickly because customers are banging down the door. Because of the recent changes in health insurance, everybody cares about price in a way that just wasn't true 10 years ago. It's a new era for everybody, consumers, insurers, and doctors and hospitals who now get whacked financially for wasteful spending or inefficient care. Privacy advocates like Joe Hall have their own concerns. He's with the Center for Democracy and Technology. Medical data security breaches happen four to five times every week. That means millions of patients' records could be compromised. The problem becomes when the choice to share that information is taken out of the, the patient's hand. Washington health officials say they take privacy seriously, but that hasn't stopped Quest to find more ways to collect data and use it. The Department of Health and Human Services, after all, is putting on the data palooza. And here's one of the big events, a codathon, to see who can come up with a brilliant way to use a bunch of Medicare claims data. HHS Chief Technology Officer Brian Sivak is overseeing the contest. What we're looking for in the teams that are competing is sort of, you know, the ability to kind of think creatively in a relatively short time frame about ways that uh, data can be used to solve some really big problems. Not exactly World of Warcraft, just a race to unlock the mysteries of our $2.8 trillion healthcare system and cash in. I'm Dan Gorenstein for Marketplace. and earthquakes and wildfires hit rich and poor and in between pretty much alike. But what about once the disaster is done? That's what this next story is about. It's been exactly two weeks since that F5 tornado ripped from the north of home. 24 people were killed, thousands more from every slice of the economy were left homeless. And as most of the news trucks were leaving town, Chrissy Clark, our wealthy poverty was heading in. She met two women, strangers, both of whom survived the storm. The beginning of these two women's tornado stories are alike. They were each home alone, each in the same neighborhood, a few blocks from where Plaza Power School collapsed. And listen to how they each describe the tornado's approach. It sounded literally like a freight train running over my shelter. That's one of the women, Cindy. Here's the other, Michelle. I live in New York City, so I've heard the trains and the subways. It is a little bit like that sound. Now, here's both of them. In the middle of the freight train sound, there is a shrill whistle of the air going through the walls and stuff. The closest I can get is... When Cindy climbed out of her underground storm bunker and Michelle crawled out of her closet, they each found their homes obliterated. Reduced, in a word, to nothing. But nothing, it turns out, is a relative term. Let's start with Cindy, Cindy B. You get a sense of what nothing really means for her when you go to the site of her former home, which is now a concrete slab with a crumbling chimney surrounded by piles of rubble. Pardon the mess. Tornado just flew through here. <laughs> for one, she still owns her sense of humor. And she still owns the property underneath this rubble, which her insurance adjuster has come out to inspect. Cindy's had a good job for years, $20 an hour, and her house was fully insured. So she should be able to rebuild and replace most of her possessions. But first, she has to itemize them all. From her windows to her TVs to what she calls her one luxury item, her hot tub. Cindy's found a few precious things in the debris. The box with a lock of her late sister's hair, a bookshelf of Star Trek memorabilia. I used to go to some conventions that have a lot of autographs and 
tech manuals for the ships and stuff. Thanks to an advance from her insurance company, Cindy's already replaced her crushed Toyota with a new one, burnt orange for her home team, the Texas Longhorns. But it's drawn stairs at disaster relief centers, so she taped the sign to the back. It says, don't let the new car fool you. Everything I own fits in it. I survived at five. Praise God in all things. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name and all God's people say. Cindy says her church has been a refuge. Church friends have given her gift cards, offered spare bedrooms in the short term. As for the longer term, hey Lynn, her friend Lynn calls to say her family has a house they're putting on the market and Cindy can stay there while she's waiting to rebuild her own. And I don't know, we hadn't talked rent or anything. I mean, I can help in. We just want to help you and if you, if you want to help, well, we'll, we'll figure that out. Cindy says losing almost everything has made her realize how much she still has. You know, I'm homeless. I'm in a much better position than a lot of other people right now. Now, let's turn to Michelle. Remember, before the tornado, she lived in the same neighborhood as Cindy. Since then, she's been staying most nights in this Red Cross shelter in downtown Moore, where an old Jackie Chan movie is playing in the rec room. She's found a new apartment to move into, but it's not ready for another week. And in the meantime, her friends' places are small, 